So glad that you are here today. And as we launch our marriage series, When I Said I Do, I want to remind you of the time that you did say I do. Raise your hand if you got all dressed up for your wedding. Men, raise your hand if you wore a suit or you wore a tux and it's the last time you wore a suit or a tux. (laughs) Or one of the last times. I'm right there with you guys. Well, today as we launch this brand new sermon series, When I Said I Do, I want to encourage you to turn to page uh, or turn to 1 Corinthians 13 uh, verses 1 through 11. If you're using one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you, you can turn to page 1140. And as always, if you're a first time guest, uh, please clean up a little bit before you come to church. I'm just kidding. If you're a first-time guest, this is not normal. Uh, But if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, I want to encourage you and invite you. Take a Bible home with you. Reach underneath the seat in front of you. Grab a Bible and use it. Write your name in it and call it your own. And and the one caveat that we, we add to that is if you do take a Bible home, would you read it and would you begin to apply it? Because we wholeheartedly believe that if we read God's word and apply his word to our lives, he will change us and he will transform us into the men and women that he's created us to be. Now, I want to acknowledge as we launch this series, not every man and woman in this auditorium, in this worship center, is currently married. Uh, some, Some of you, though, long to be married. And uh, we want to acknowledge that maybe some of you have been through a divorce. Maybe some of you have lost a spouse. Uh, Maybe some have even lost a spouse recently. And so we, we acknowledge that this focus on marriage might be difficult for you. But if you are married, we hope and pray that God will truly strengthen your marriage. And if you're not yet married, or if you're going to be married again one day, that God would uh, strengthen you and encourage you in your future marriage through this series. So over the next four weeks, we're going to be taking a look at the traditional wedding vows, uh, the wedding vows that are exchanged during almost every ceremony. And on the last week of our series, we are going to give you an opportunity to renew your marriage vows at the close of our service. So if you've been married for a while, if you've been married for a short time, but if you've had that desire to renew your vows with your spouse, at the end of these four weeks, on that fourth week, we're going to invite you, Pastor Chad is going to stand here at the close of the service, invite you to stand and renew your marriage vows. And if you've been living together and you've not yet been married, I want to invite you, get your marriage certificate. We would love to see you uh, join as husband and wife at the close of this series. Uh, We'd love to see that happen. If that's you, Reach out to us. We'd love to make it happen. In fact, it will be the most affordable wedding you could ever possibly imagine. (laughs) Guys, let me tell you something. That's a big deal. Do you remember when you said I do? It was in 1999 for me. December 11th, 1999. Christy Lou Lumpkins... And I stood at the altar at Grace Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee, in front of a crowd of roughly 300 people. We had uh, made a covenant there in front of everyone to remain married to one another no matter what. We exchanged our vows. We lit a unity candle. And we were pronounced legally and spiritually husband and wife. And then we kissed one another. And let me tell you something, there's something a little nerve-wracking about kissing your spouse in front of that many people, especially her side of the family. And let me tell you something about our first kiss as husband and wife. It was awesome. I mean, Christy laid one on me like you would not believe. And I'm not teasing you, I'm not kidding. In fact, here's a picture. She grabbed the back of my neck There's a picture coming. 
I mean, she grabbed the back of my neck and she smashed me into her mouth. And she kissed me so hard, I was afraid her brother was going to beat me up after the wedding. (laughs) And after we were pronounced husband and wife, we walked down that center aisle. Friends from church, friends from college, her family, her side of the family, my side of the family. They were all gathered there and they're throwing rice and they're blowing bubbles and they're applauding as we walk down the aisle. All of them cheering for us and celebrating. And right after we left the worship center and we walked through the double doors for just a few brief moments, we were alone. And let me tell you, I did the most girly thing I've ever done. As we hugged one another, I started just sobbing. I did. I just broke down like sobbing and crying. And Christy said, what's wrong? And in in my head, I had all these emotions and all these thoughts running through. I could not believe that Christy followed through with her agreement to marry me. You're laughing. I'm not. I mean, I really thought there's no way that I could catch a girl like this. There's no way that God would allow me to marry such an incredible, incredible woman. She's beautiful. She's attractive. She's sexy. She's my best friend. It's just not going to happen. And when it did, I couldn't believe it. Because as a child, I grew up with a lot of disappointment. I was used to being let down. And now here was this gorgeous woman standing across from me, having already agreed to marry me. She said yes. I said yes. She said I do. I said I do. And now she's stuck with me (laughs) forever. That, in a nutshell, is the story of our wedding day. And chances are your wedding day story is similar. There were people there. There weren't people there. There was an officiant there who said, do you, do you, do you exchange some sort of vows? And when you exchanged vows with your spouse, the officiant turned to you at some point and asked you to repeat after him something like this. And these aren't our vows, but these are the typical generic vows that we would hear in a movie or on TV. We said something like, I, Joe, take you, Christy, to be my lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, to love and to cherish for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others till death do us part. Raise your hand if your vows were something similar to that when you were married. I I want to remind you, as you pledged your life together to your spouse, your vow exchange was more than just a piece of paper. Your vow exchange was more than just a legal exchange. It was more than just a legal document. It was more than just a formality. In front of your friends, in front of your family, in front of God, you made a covenant with one another that no matter what, the two of you are going to stick together through the highs, through the lows of life, whether you go broke, whether you get rich, whether you stay healthy, whether you get cancer, and that no matter what, you pledge to continue to love and to cherish one another until the day you die. That was the commitment that many of us made. That was the covenant that many of us made with one another. That's huge. And also, for me, it was a declaration to my friends, hey, she's taken, she's mine, so back off and quit flirting with her in the gym. And now, nearly 25 pounds, 22 years later, two and a half years of battling depression for myself, eight houses that we've lived in, five states that we lived in, six years of infertility, four children, all girls, and three with T1D, Christy and I still say, I do, to one another. Thanks. 
And let me tell you, from Christy's perspective, it has not been easy. Uh, it has been far more easy for me than it has been for her. What about you? We still say, I do. Do you still say, I do, to your spouse? Today, we're going to focus on the vow, the line in the vow to love and to cherish. About love, the Apostle Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, and it's one of the passages that's almost used in every single marriage across the United States of America. It's a, vow, it's a passage that focuses on love. It describes what love is with just such a great, great explanation. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning at verse 1. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all away I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Now this passage is by far the most definitive in defining and describing what love genuinely is. One afternoon, I was talking to my daughters, and I asked, I asked them, I said, girls, how can we show love to people who are mean to us? Violet said, punching them. <laughs> Sophia said, that's not loving them, and Violet said, it is for me. <laughs> so don't make Violet mad. I think, in so, I think sometimes in marriage, we truly do misunderstand what love is. Much of the time, we think we're demonstrating love in our marriage, and much of it is useless. Much of it is empty. Much of it is, as Paul described, amounts to nothing. Like Violet, we can have a wrong understanding of love. In fact, marriage is obnoxious without love. Marriage is obnoxious without this kind of love being displayed between a husband and wife. Back in the first century, in pagan temples, uh, they had a big gong or a cymbal that would hang over their temples. And when people would come to worship, they would hit the gong or they would hit the cymbal to awaken these non-existent pagan gods to wake them up and to let them know that they were there and they had some requests to them. What, when Paul uses this phrase about the, the, the love uh, is empty like a clanging gong or a, a, a clanging cymbal, Paul was saying that even if he serves, even if he sacrifices, even if he speaks eloquently in many different languages, if he does it all without love, it's meaningless. It's just as meaningless as beating a gong to awaken a non-existent God. And I think so often in marriages, husbands and wives, they start going through the motions and think that going through the motions is actually showing love. I can't tell you the number of times that I've counseled people in, as, as a husband and wife, and the husband says, I do show her love. Or the wife says it, I do show them love. I get up every day and I go to work and I earn money so we can pay the bills, so we can have a house and so we can have a car. 
while their husband or wife, whichever one, sits on the other side, not feeling any type of love from their spouse. They're just going through the motions and they're not truly demonstrating love. You can go to work, you can do the dishes, you can do the laundry, you can fill up the car every week with gas, you can clean the house, you can pay the bills, and you can complain about it the whole time, and you can do all of those things without genuinely loving your spouse. Remember, that covenant that you made with your spouse was to love and to cherish and to be fully devoted to them, forsaking all others that nobody else is in existence when it comes to the opposite sex. It's just you and your honey for the rest of your lives. Have you ever been around a clanging cymbal? Yes? No? Now, I love coming out in worship to the clanging cymbals, you know, the old, and it sounds really pretty and nice. But I've got news for you. I. Can you imagine? Honey, I'm doing the dishes. Hey, honey, I'm, I'm filling up the car with gas. Don't you love what I'm doing for you? Raise your hand if you found that obnoxious. <laughs> Over the top, obnoxious, irritating. A marriage without love is just like that too. Now it might, be not, it might not be to the one that's the clanging symbol, but it certainly is to the other one that's not. And marriage is not supposed to be two irritating people, two people irritating one another for the rest of their lives. We don't see that anywhere in the covenant that we made with one another. To love and to cherish and to irritate you till no end. <laughs> Yet a marriage without genuine love is just as obnoxious. It's irritating to your family it's irritating to your friends, it's irritating to your children, and it's irritating and obnoxious to those who are married as well. We can do all the right things in marriage, but if we serve our spouse without love, it's obnoxious. So let me ask you a question. Are you growing more in love with your spouse every day are you, or are you growing more irritated with one another? Are you growing more in love with the woman or with the man that you committed to spending the rest of your life to? Are you loving your spouse the way that you hoped that you would all those years ago when you got married? Do you know the love language of your spouse? What I mean by love language is everybody has a way in which they best receive love. Every person has a way in which uh, they're designed and wired to receive love. There's acts of service. People, uh, your spouse will love it if you do something for them. That really lights their love tank. Or there's receiving gifts. It may be that you give your spouse a gift and that just fills their heart with so much love. It could be quality time, spending quality time with somebody and that just fills up their love tank. Or maybe it's words of affirmation, that when you speak words of affirmation to your spouse, they feel like they could climb a mountain. I mean, they feel like they can do anything. Or it may be physical touch. That's the best way that they receive love. Now, my two top love languages are words of affirmation. Go figure, I'm a preacher. Oh, that was a good job this morning, honey, right? Words of affirmation and physical touch. I love it when my wife compliments me. I love it when she encourages me. And I love it when we touch. That's why we have four children. Now, let me encourage you. If you don't know what your spouse's love language is, Go to this website, fivelovelanguages.com. Both you and your spouse 
take this assessment that's on there. It's absolutely free. All they're going to ask for is your email address. You can give them that. Give them, their, give them your email address. Fill out this love assessment online. They'll email the, the results to you immediately and you'll discover what your spouse's love language is and then you can begin to love your spouse the way that they best receive love as opposed to you just loving them the way that you want to be loved, right? Uh, I find myself guilty of that all the time because words of affirmation and physical touch is my love language and I start to love my spouse the way that I want to receive love. Words of affirmation. I told her all weekend, you're an amazing mother. Like, you're just amazing. We had uh, girls stay the night at the house last night, and Christy was up till like 1 o'clock in the morning with them, and they're doing hair, and they're doing makeup, and she got all this spread out on the counter, and I'm just like, oh, you're so amazing. You're such an amazing woman. What I should have done is got, went out and got her a gift card because her love language is gifts. One of her love language is gifts and quality time. And I should have said to her, sweetheart, man, let's just go out and spend some time together today. And I didn't, so I'm making up for it later on with physical touch. <laughs> See, if, if we continue to love our spouse the way that we receive love, we're actually demonstrating selfishness. We're demanding our own way, even in demonstrating love. And demanding your own way eliminates oneness. Demanding your own way eliminates oneness. Now, it's important that you get that. Remember when God created Adam and Eve? God created Adam and Eve, and in Genesis 2, 24, Moses writes, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Moses wasn't just speaking about the physical act of two becoming one. Moses is saying they're literally one person. God's plan for your marriage is that two selfish, self-centered people would come together and join as one. Not two people having selfish goals. Not two people seeking to grow and do their own thing and being more like roommates than husband and wife. Two people seeking to grow together in oneness. Oneness means that you're pulling in the same direction. Oneness means the two of you are working together to advance God's kingdom in your marriage. If you have children, oneness means that you're working together to raise your children in a godly home that loves the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oneness means you're quick to forgive. Oneness means you're quick to seek forgiveness when you mess up. It means you accept the apology that your spouse gives to you and you show mercy to one another. And oneness means that when your spouse does do something stupid and boneheaded, that you're quick to show them the same mercy that God has shown you. And demanding your own way in marriage ruins God's plan for you. Demanding your own way in marriage ruins oneness. I, I could probably tell you honestly from this, this pulpit today that probably almost every one of my wife and I's arguments and fights over the last 22 years, the root cause was one of us was being selfish. One of us was demanding our own way. One of us was insisting that we were right and the other one was wrong. That was me. And Christy too, and she'd be honest in saying that. See, when we demand our own way and when we insist on marriage as it's my way or the highway, and husbands, if you view yourselves as the chief tiebreaker in your marriage, you don't understand what oneness is. Oneness requires humility. Oneness requires modeling what Jesus did for us 
In Philippians 2, he gave up his rights as God to become a servant. And husbands, we give up our rights as the chief tiebreaker and we become the servant. We give up our rights as my way or the highway and we become the servant in our home. You'll never know the joy of oneness if you always insist on having things your way. Can I get an amen? Amen. And frankly, your spouse needs you to grow up. Husbands or wives, your spouse needs you to grow up. I love what the Apostle Paul said in verse 11. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, he said, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up foolish ways, or I gave up childish ways. Now look at this passage in context. What was Paul talking about? He was describing what love is. Have you ever been around a child? I have four children, so I feel like I can be an expert on this. Children are impatient. Children insist on their own way. Children don't understand why you won't let them go over to somebody's house. Children don't understand why they can't have their own way. Children hold their breath. Children stomp their feet. Children I want my way, and they throw temper tantrums until they get a little paddle on their behind. Children are incredible blessings, but they can be the most selfish monsters in the world. They're awesome, but it takes a lot of patience and a lot of perseverance to raise children. You know why? Because they're a lot like us adults. Selfish, self-centered. Well, tell me why you can't do this on my timeline. We just use different words. Don't tell me my son got a bad grade in your class. See, a child can't see from another person's perspective Actually, their minds are not formed. Their their brain isn't formed. It is impossible for a child to see from the perspective of another person. And that's why they stomp their feet and hold their breath and throw temper tantrums when they don't get their way. Because they physically are unable to see from another person's point of view. And if you find that yourself, you're always insistent that your spouse does things your way, it's time that you grew up. Tell the boy inside of you to sit down and call the man to stand up. Tell the little girl inside of you that it's time to sit down and call out that godly woman inside of you to stand up. It's time to put childish ways behind us if we want our marriages to thrive. If we want our children to rise up and call us blessed, we have to make sure that we are living unselfish lives, lives that model Jesus of giving up our own rights. Stop insisting on our own way. Being patient and being kind. God loves you and he wants you to put childish ways behind you. And one of the ways that you can do that is by being a part of Celebrate Recovery. See, what I love about, what I love about Celebrate Recovery is that sometimes people think, well, that's just for you know, people with addictions to drugs and alcohol. And I think, no, it's for people with addictions to selfishness. It's people with addictions to self-centeredness. People who only think about themselves and pleasing themselves. Let me encourage you, husbands and wives, 
consider being a part of Celebrate Recovery because they, they deal with hurts, habits, and hang-ups that we all experience in life. You're not that same individual that you were so many years ago when you committed to your husband or your wife. We need God's grace to continue to grow so that our marriages don't become stale. We need other people to speak into our lives to be able to say, well, see, I I see you wrestling with this. And so maybe if Celebrate Recovery is not for you, maybe you need to find another married couple within the church who seems like they have it together and ask them to mentor you and your wife or you and your husband. And ask them, say, hey, will you meet with us on a regular basis and just, here's what we're struggling with. How did you get through it? If you're interested in something like that, you can sign up online at our marriage mentoring. So go to, go to our Calvary website and go to the events page and sign up for our marriage mentoring and somebody will reach back out to you and pair you up. And if we don't have enough mentors, maybe you should become a marriage mentor. Maybe if you've got it down, you're not perfect, but you've seen the grace of God unfold in your marriage. Maybe it's time that you signed up and said, you know what? I want to be part of something like that. I want to invest in marriages in Havasu and in Parker and in our online community to help them become every bit of what God intends them to be. And finally, seriously, check out fivelovelanguages.com. It's a great place to begin to learn the love language of your spouse. And it will change your life if you, if you allow it to. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that we are blessed with the gift of marriage. A, a man and a woman coming together as husband and wife being one for the rest of their lives till death do us part. Lord, we understand that so many, so often we've, we've made this commitment and for so many of us, it's been a flippant, last-minute decision. Lord, for some, I, some look at marriage as though it's just getting a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend. And Lord, you've designed marriage to be so much more, to mean so much more to the body of Christ. And Lord, it's our prayer that you would continue to transform every one of the marriages represented in here in the present and in the future. God, that you would bless them, that you would unite them together as one, and that together every marriage would begin to grow in their relationship with one another, that you would strengthen them, strengthen their families, and bless them beyond belief. Help us to love and to cherish one another the way we committed to and made a covenant with our spouse to. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said.